on the wheel to advance. Well, you can use the arrows on the keyboard. Oh, good. Oh, I can use enter on the keyboard. Okay, good. Well, uh, thank you. It's wonderful to be here. Um, no one listens to me at home anymore. So it's really great to come to the UK and have an audience like this. This is an illustration taken from the New Scientist, an issue not long ago, uh, that was about Takeo Hinch's work on reopening critical periods. This image is kind of a, a common one uh, we see uh, in talking about early childhood. We have this interaction between a caregiver, looks like the grandfather, and a, a child. It's centered around music. Very good. And what we're hoping is the score is classical. <laughs> we know how bad jazz, blues, and supers is for the brain. Okay. So um, what I thought uh, I would do today uh, is uh, use this structure. I want to talk a little bit about early intervention prior to neuroscience. I want to talk about the allure of brain science that ran from 94 to 2000. And I think what distinguishes this theme <clears throat> is that advocates of early childhood intervention approach neuroscientists to provide sound bites to su uh, support policy. Then I want to turn to translating neuroscience into policy, which kind of shifts the picture where academic scientists and academic institutions are attempting to develop early intervention policy based on their interpretation of neuro neuroscience. And I'll conclude with just some um, uh, issues and questions we might consider an hour later. So before neuroscience, uh, I, I thought this would be useful because in the report we'll be hearing about later this afternoon, uh, the authors make this well-known point that uh, this idea about the effects of early intervention and parenting uh, in the policy arena uh, precedes by far uh, the current applications of neuroscience to make these policy claims. In the United States, we can trace this back uh, at least until uh, the 1960s. Uh, Lyndon Baines Johnson, as part of the War on Poverty, instituted the Head Start program. Head Start was an educational intervention for lower economic status children that also provided nutrition uh, and health support. Uh, it was initially conceived as a political action program uh, that would empower adults. It was not firmly based on either neuroscience or developmental psychology. But when you look at the literature now, you see dozens of males who claim to have been the father of Head Start who are all early childhood scientists. There are no mothers in Head Start, I'm sorry to say. So uh, this was the recommendation made by a panel to President Johnson, pointing out the early childhood years, uh, the most critical in the uh, poverty cycle, and that if something could be done in these early years to uh, 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 prevent these effects of poverty, you would increase child's, uh, child's chances for uh, a better life throughout. Uh, Robert Cook was a pediatrician. He was Sergeant Shriver's pediatrician. Uh, Shriver uh, was really the administrator who uh, spearheaded the Head Start effort and who had a child who had a, a se severe mental retardation. The evidence uh, for the Head Start project is best summarized in this testimony Benjamin Bloom gave to Congress in 1965 shortly after the Head Start authorization, uh, where he summarized some of his work, uh, claiming that uh, the very early years of childhood are the most important for learning, uh, and only smaller changes in learning potential take place thereafter. And he came to the viewpoint uh, that while much can be done for culturally deprived children at various ages, by far the greatest effect can be produced in one to two years of preschool experience in the period three to five years. So this is big in the United States again uh, because of the interest in universal pre-K education. Um, however, uh, these kind of uh, strong claims about the effects of early intervention uh, soon were mitigated by behavioral research, and this is, is just an excerpt from a 1994 uh, study published by Jeannie Brooks Gunn 
and her associates on uh, life outcomes of low birth weight premature infants. And part of the Bloom idea was that this early experience would somehow inoculate or immunize uh, children from further uh, difficulties later in life. And what the uh, low birth weight premature uh, infant studies seemed to indicate that although early experience had some effect, uh, particularly for low birth weight children of uh, low economic status, we could not see this as a sufficiently powerful intervention that would have lifelong effects. In 1990, uh, the original Head Start authorization was beginning to run out. They were looking at a new authorization uh, to be considered by Congress in 1994. And there was an interesting uh, piece in Science Magazine by Constance Holden that kind of described the academic or research scientist view of what was good and what was deficient about the Head Start effort. Um, so the first thing Constance points out is al although there's a, this assumption <clears throat> that early childhood interventions have these powerful lifelong effects, uh, the evidence really isn't there to support such strong conclusions. Uh, the second concern was that al although uh, Head Start had some effects, the effects they were measuring at the time seemed to disappear by the time the children uh, reached ages uh, of seven or eight. Um, Sandra Scar, who has uh, kind of always been a critic of a lot of these programs, pointed out that there really was no evidence for these long-term interventions uh, having lifelong uh, impact, at least uh, circa 1994. And the policy recommendation, although made reluctantly uh, uh, by the scientists, was that rather than start earlier, the best thing to do might to be continue special educational interventions for children later, at least into the third grade. So there was a lot of concern about this reauthorization and what might happen. Um, that brings us to the allure of neuroscience. Of course, 1990 to 2000 in the United States was declared the decade of the brain uh, by George Herbert Walker Bush. Uh, the initial uh, support for this project came from the National Institutes of Mental Health in the United States, but the cause was soon taken up by various private foundations, including MacArthur, Dana, uh, and, and several others. The purpose was uh, to point out how research in neuroscience had relevance for social problems, initially uh, emphasizing uh, problems of mental illness. So the stage had been set uh, to introduce brain science into the reauthorization of not only Head Start, but early Head Start, which would begin at birth and continue to age three. So the initial uh, policy document in this area, starting points, was funded by a Carnegie Mellon Corporation in New York, a private foundation, and made the claim, again, that these early preschool years had an overpowering effect on children's uh, lifelong uh, experiences. David Hamburg, a psychiatrist, was president of the corporation at that at the time, and in his press release about the report stated that uh, starting points was focused on strong evidence from research on brain and behavior development indicating long-term effects of early experience. And what really caught the media's attention about this report was the brain science. What is interesting, if you go back and look at the report, the neuroscience is confined to two and a half pages at the beginning of the report. It was put in by the report's author kind of after the fact. Uh, to try to pr provide some neuroscientific background for the later policy recommendations. So neuroscience in the context of this report was kind of an afterthought, but yet it was the one that really pushed the report into the general media and into the policy realm. Based on the success of starting points, uh, there was a second document published, Rethinking the Brain, Again, uh, by age two, toddlers' brains are as active as those of adults. By the age of three, 85% of a child's brain development takes place by the age of five. These claims are quite familiar to all of us by now. But what was different about rethinking the brain, as part of preparing and publishing the document, 
the funders for the report had uh, extensive meetings with public relations experts to try to craft a message. And the idea was that uh, uh, soldering neurons and counting neurons gave a very concrete material explanation for parenting and child development that appealed not only to women, they found out, but also appealed to men. So this was a very self-conscious attempt to integrate ideas or themes or motifs from neuroscience you know, into the early childhood policy realm. Again, very successful because it was the key document at a White House conference held in 1996 by Hillary Clinton. So why the first three years? Uh, a question I've asked myself. Well, one easy answer is zero to three comes before three to five. Uh, and if we want early childhood intervention to start earlier, well, zero to three. But I think there's a, a, deep, a deeper but maybe implicit reason for the zero to three uh, interest. And I think that comes from attachment theory. Now, I'm not going to say a great deal about attachment theory because just this month, an extensive report on attachment theory and its policy implications has been uh, published in this country. Although we might disagree with the policy implications of that report, it gives a very detailed uh, history of attachment theory and its central tenets. But again, the idea is that these early years uh, have a lifelong impact on the kinds of personal interactions and relationships a person has throughout their lifespan. So, uh, in my opinion, the zero to three thing has always had a considerable uh, relationship uh, and uh, commitment to ideas that arise uh, from attachment theory and psychiatry. So, that prompted me to come up with something I called the myth of the first three years based on the policy documents that I've talked about and others. And the central claim of the myth as I characterize it was that the first three years of life is a period of rapid synapse formation. This is the critical period in brain development during which learning is easiest and most efficient. And during the critical period, environmental enrichment has profound irreversible effects on the brain. Now, I countered these claims uh, in, in this way very briefly. The first three years of life is a period of rapid synapse formation. But what these changes in brain structure imply for brain function and behavior is only asserted by the advocates of this position. It's never demonstrated. And uh, key examples of scientists you can look at who are keen to talk about the structure but say little about function are the late Peter Huttenlocker, uh, Harry Trudani, and Bruce Perry. Uh, critical or better sensitive periods do occur in development but they do not map easily onto periods of rapid synapse formation, nor is learning easiest and most efficient during this period. There are abundant examples from research both on animals and infants that learning certain tasks that depend on, uh, say, memory, uh, actually get better as the synaptic density decreases. And we can look at a slide like that later if you wish. Uh, and then finally, in rodent studies, enriched environments by which they meant putting a rat in a cage that was more like the environment the rat would be in, in the wild rather than living by itself in a, uh, uh, in a laboratory cage, did increase the synaptic density in areas of the rodent brain, visual cortex in particular. But, as the authors of this work uh, also pointed out, <clears throat> that this kind of effect of enrichment has an effect throughout the life uh, span of the rodent, and it's really never been clear how this particular finding might generalize to humans. So, uh, for the last uh, conference um, that uh, I was invited to, September 2013, I wrote a paper that's on the, the Kent website where I went back and looked at all the citations and reviews of my book, The Myth of the First Three Years, and tried to get a sense of what the response of the academic community uh, was to the book. Uh, several of the comments were favorable. 
the, the claims, uh, policy, uh, claims of policy interventions were well intended, but the evidence really did not support the, the strong claims ad, ad, uh, advocates were making. And I thought most interestingly, uh, Michael Rudder, this misleading extrapolation uh, of the findings on experience expect expected development has been extrapolated into a very different kind of learning context where the sensitive or critical periods of experience uh, expectant plasticity do not apply. And we'll say more about experience ex expectant versus experience dependent brain change later on. However, uh, uh, child psychiatrists were not pleased by the book. Uh, and I include a summary of a comment by Shore. Uh, books on early childhood development, like The Myth and Science Test in the Crib by Alison Gopnik et al., take no account of the effects of early trauma, abuse, and neglect on developing brain anatomy. I think Shore is right in this regard. But I'm not sure that the psychiatric community really has uh, an answer uh, to these issues, at least not an answer based on the neuroscience they cite. There was a recognition that a lot of the claims in the early uh, policy documents were overgeneralized. Uh, Charles Nelson uh, uh, points out that um, uh, Early experience in general is not, uh, cannot be characterized as uh, a critical period phenomenon. And uh, Jack Schoenkopf, uh, that the overgeneralization over of research on critical periods fuel the erroneous conclusion that human brain development is effectively solidified by age three years. Uh, Jack is one of the leading advocates of early childhood intervention and policy. So I think this was an interesting recognition that they had to reconsider some of the claims they were making um, about neuroscience and early childhood. So uh, now I want to turn to translating neuroscience into policy, and here we're going to turn uh, to the scenario where it's academic scientists are getting together uh, to think about neuroscience and child psychiatry and are developing policy recommendations based on that work. And then they are going to public relations firms to hone their message. So it's a bit of a, a, a flip uh, from what happened between 1994 and 2000. So the beginning of this strain of uh, neuroscience and early uh, childhood inter interventions became, uh, was started with the uh, Research Network on Early Experience of Brain Development. This was sponsored by the MacArthur Foundation in Chicago and the McDonald Foundation in St. Louis. I'm the president of the McDonald Foundation in St. Louis. Um, we thought that it would be very interesting to have an outstanding group of scholars who would seriously look at uh, the scientific basis for claims about the effects of early experience on brain development. The people involved in the network uh, are, are listed here, and I'm sure there are names you recognize uh, from the literature that's been published in this area since then. Uh, there's some excellent scientists in the group. However, if you look at the backgrounds of the people involved, uh, the individuals represented in the research group were overwhelmingly uh, psychiatrists. We ceased funding the research network. The McDonald Foundation ceased funding it after three years for several reasons. Uh, one was that there was a tension, I felt, in the group there were people who wanted to do serious science about early childhood development and early brain development, and there were other people who were only interested in policy advocacy. Uh, the second reason we withdrew from the support is it appeared to me that the representatives of the MacArthur Foundation were very intrusive in the scientific discussion, and it kind of became clear there was a favored conclusion they were looking for. So this was not our idea of how 
the McDonald Foundation should support serious scientific research in this area. But one of the uh, commitments of the network was not only to do the research, the research they did was primarily on animal models of cognition, but to take these findings and findings on neuroscience more generally and apply them in the policy realm. That effort uh, led to the book by Shankoff and Phillips, From Neurons to Neighborhoods, uh, which is not a bad summary of the importance and influence of early childhood experience on development, you know, quite reasonable compared to what came before and what came afterwards. That report um, and this MacArthur seminar developed once again into the Center on the Developing Child at Harvard University. And the document in the slide, The Science of Early Childhood Development, closing the gap between what we know and what we do, uh, I'm sure, as you all know, is cited very often in policy documents in this country as well as in the United States. Now, what's interesting about this particular document is there are no scientific references in it. It's a piece for the public, and it's next to impossible to find out where the science came from based on this document. Um, if you want to understand the scientific basis for the thinking at the Early Childhood Center, I would uh, recommend you look at an article from the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences by Eric Knudsen, James Heckman, Judy Cameron, and uh, Jack Chonkoff. Uh, all four of these individuals are affiliated with the group at Harvard. And their central claims, their central idea is there are principles we've learned from basic science research that can be applied to designing early childhood programs. And the, uh, the scientific findings central uh, uh, to these principles are that early experience has a uniquely powerful influence on the development of cognitive and social skills and on brain architecture and neurochemistry. That both skill development and brain maturation are hierarchical processes in which higher level functions depend on and build on lower level functions. And that the capacity for change in the foundations of human skill development and neural circuitry is highest earlier, earlier in life and decreases over time. These findings, they argue, <clears throat> lead to the conclusion that the most efficient strategy for strengthening the future workforce, both economically and neurobiologically, and improving its quality of life, is to invest in the environments of disadvantaged children during their early childhood years. Uh, the ideas about sensitive and critical periods that figure in this policy perspective are best summarized and studied in a paper by Eric Knudsen that appeared in the Journal of Cognitive Neuroscience um, in 2004. What's interesting about Eric's paper is that previously we thought about critical periods primarily as being defined by behavioral studies, experiences before this time have no effect, experiences during this time have an effect, experiences after this time uh, have no effect, critical period. Of course, with the work of Hubel and, and Wiesel, uh, there really was an attempt to link the critical period phenomenon to what happened in visual cortex uh, based on uh, the occlusion of one eye in kittens. Uh, somebody said blinded by neuroscience, it's kind of a source of this. So what's interesting about uh, uh, this paper is that there's a real kind of reductionist attempt to link all these uh, ideas to what's going on at the level of neural circuitry. It would be very nice if we could do that, and maybe one day we will be able to. And the idea here is that what matters is the neurons, not the behavior. Uh, so if a child can go through uh, development and end up with the right behaviors but the wrong neurons, for some reason the kid's in big trouble. Um, I'm not sure I totally agree with that view. But I, I encourage you to look at this paper because it's uh, uh, a central paper in this whole literature. So uh, based on the scientific view uh, and, and <clears throat> prior to the uh, uh, developing uh, 
be the, the science of childhood uh, development. Shankoff and his colleagues worked with a group called the Frameworks Institute uh, in Washington, D.C. It's headed by Susan Bales. This is one of their articles that appeared in the journal Child Development in 2011. And their idea is that, while well, science does not speak for itself, it requires academics to translate scientific results into a language any person on the street <coughs> or under the street uh, could understand. So working with the Frameworks Institute, they came up with uh, a core story of childhood development using simplifying models or, or metaphors such as brain architecture, toxic stress, and servant return to explain complex scientific concepts to non-scientists. The mission of the Frameworks Institute is to work with nonprofits to develop a message, an effective message that can be used in policy advocacy. Their claim is understanding which frames serve to advance which policy options with which groups become central to any movement strategy. The literature of social movements suggests that the prudent choice of frames and the ability to effectively contrast the opposition's frame lie at the heart of successful policy advocacy. Now, uh, the document from the Early Childhood Center that I showed you originally went through various drafts. Uh, these drafts were done in cooperation with people at the Framework Institute. And they worked for a while and field tested and used uh, panels of, of, uh, uh, drawn from the public to come up with these simplifying models. So they originally they came up with brain architecture as a way to capture the material nature of the developmental foundation. This material foundation goes back to the synapse counting and soldering I, I, I spoke about earlier. It gives a very graphical um, uh, image and a materialistic explanation of human development. They emphasize interactions as a way to element, uh, elevate the dynamic processes be between child and environment, nature and nurture. And they pointed out the importance of stress-related chemicals in the brain as a way to make vivid the damaging effects of exposure to stress. Uh, after further field testing, they refined uh, those simple models, uh, refined two of, two of them. Uh, they recharacterized interaction as servant return, in which the interactive nature of the child and his environment is equated with the game of tennis. Apparently, they've never played tennis. <laughs> Serving is not a cooperative endeavor. Uh, stress related chemicals in the brain has been expanded to differentiate between positive, tolerable, and toxic stress in order to help people understand the buffering effects of caring adults and the deleterious effects of unrelieved exposure. Now, although toxic stress was originally proposed as a simplifying model, if you check the literature of late, it's now, uh, it has become a scientific term uh, to characterize uh, uh, effects of cortisol on brain development, and uh, the, the simplifying model has been incorporated back into neuroscientific research. These documents have been very successful. On the left-hand column, I've taken some quotations from the science of early childhood development. The right-hand column contains quotations from Parenting Matters, published in this country in 2011 by Chris Peterson at the Center Forum. Uh, the idea of brain architecture appears, taken directly from the Harvard study. The serve and return idea comes directly from the Harvard uh, document. Toxic stress comes directly from the Harvard document, as does the contention or the claim that the brain's capacity for change decreases with age. Of course, that claim is true, uh, but it's not clear uh, when we should really be concerned. Uh, about decreases in, uh, in learning. I, I know I should be, but uh, <laughs> many of you probably need not worry about it. So it's, it's really amazing how well this message has been picked up by policy advocacy groups almost word for word. I think the criticisms that I raised in the myth still apply uh, uh, 
uh, to this latest round of neuroscience and early intervention. If you look at the scientific paper in, in PMAS, the lead examples in that paper are the Perry Preschool Project and the Abyssidarian Project. Uh, I can tell you more about those. I'm sure you're familiar with them. What those studies showed was that interventions prior to formal schooling enhanced the benefits of school attendance. There was no claim in either of those articles about the existence of sensitive or critical periods. Uh, interventions are early in these two studies because schooling starts early in North America. So this is not an evidence for a biologically privileged sensitive period. It's just evidence that to do B, you might have to learn how to do A first, not that you have to learn it at age three as opposed to age seven. Uh, there's also uh, claims being made about higher level functions and how they build on lower level functions, but there's really no metric of complexity or higher or lower um, in these documents. And higher level means later in development, lower level means earlier in development, best I can tell. Uh, skills beget skills, that's true, but most skilled learning is not developmentally constrained. Speed and ease of learning depends much more on prior experience and prior knowledge, uh, not so much uh, on biological maturation, and it does not necessarily require early experience. It requires earlier experience. Uh, and again, the relation between synaptogenesis, synaptic pruning, and skill development remains vague and very unclear. Just to uh, go back a bit, um, uh, I mentioned earlier the, a, a distinction that Bill Greeno and his colleagues made about experience expectant versus experience dependent brain plasticity. Uh, Greeno characterized experience expectant uh, as a kind of brain change that's limited to developing species-wide characteristics like seeing, audition, and the first language. The stimulation you need during sensitive periods to acquire these skills is widely available in any normal human, uh, human environment where the bounds on what's normal is quite wide. Uh, and, but these kinds of changes can be subject to critical or sensitive period constraints. At the time, Bill claimed that this kind of brain change might be due to a mechanism that uh, involves the loss of pre-existing synapses in the child's brain. I put a question mark there because I haven't followed this literature, and there may be uh, other views about the mechanism for these kind of changes rather than the one Bill characterized in 2001. Then there's experience-dependent plasticity, uh, where uh, this allows the nervous system and the brain to respond to situations and stimuli that are specific to an individual's environment. Uh, it allows us, based on personal experience, to adapt to our environment, to remember things, uh, and to guide our behavior. This kind of learning is not subject to critical or sensitive period constraints. And Bill uh, suggested at the time that experience-dependent plasticity might best be thought of as based on forming new synapses uh, while you're learning and pretty much throughout the lifespan. This is a further articulation of the distinction between uh, experience expectant and experience dependent <coughs> brain plasticity that I uh, took from a lecture that Michael Rudder delivered. Uh, the slides for this lecture are still online. They're available at the uh, website at the bottom of the uh, slide. Uh, he is, points out that experience expectant effects are like what we see in Hubel and Wiesel with development of the visual system. It's expectant because the species expects to find these kinds of stimuli in its environment. Uh, he also breaks ex uh, experience expectant down into another category called experience adaptive. Uh, and finally, he uh, talks about experience dependent effects. And he says, <clears throat> unlike the first two varieties, Experience-dependent effects are not restricted to any kind of sensitive period uh, phenomenon. 
And in a 2002 article, which I highly recommend, he discusses uh, this movement uh, to apply neuroscience to early childhood development and points out explicitly that there is a problem in overgeneralizing claims and our understanding of experience-dependent plasticity to a much wider range of phenomena and learning environments where these biological and maturational <coughs> constraints uh, do not apply. I would like to point out, I, I did say earlier, that the early um, uh, documents made a lot of claims about function based only on structure. I just want to give you several examples. Again, you've all seen these quotes um, in the policy literature. I've used the Allen and Duncan Smith report, the Field report, and the Allen report as examples of these claims uh, about uh, uh, what's going on in the baby's brain at age three. So it's uh, developed 85%, 80% formed, 25% of their brains developed, rapid period of development, so that by the age of three, their brains are 80% developed. Um, the fact of the matter is the 80% figure applies to the uh, volume or mature weight of a child's brain at age three. It does have this weight and volume. What that says about brain function is nothing. This is a, a slide we've seen all over. Uh, I've <coughs> seen it used in neuroscientist presentations. It originates with Bruce Perry. And what it claims to show with the pink line is the brain's capacity to change uh, over one's lifetime and how foolishly we're spending our money uh, when it will not have any effect on people's brains. I called a neuroscientist who used this slide in one of his presentations, and I said, well, you know, what's, where's this data? Where are you getting this from? I'd really like to say, oh, there's no data. So this is just a cartoon. It's a characterization. Very interesting. Uh, this is a slide taken from the same article in New Scientist that talked about Takedo Hinch's work on critical periods. And again, what this slide summarizes is the time course of rapid synaptic development in various parts of the brain and the synaptic pruning that occurs later in life, uh, uh, later in childhood, until the synaptic densities in the various parts of the brain. Uh, reach the mature levels. Uh, in the original National Institute of Mental Health version of the slide, sensitivity is actually sensitivity to learning. And again, all this slide shows us is the course of synaptic development and pruning in early childhood that says nothing about what these changes mean uh, for learning. So again, powerful functional claims being made on structural data alone. Okay. So I'd like to close with just some issues and questions we might discuss later. I mean, many of you, I assume, have seen Baby Bonds. Uh, that's come out recently. And again, as I said, it's a nice summary of the history of attachment research and the methodology. Uh, maybe the claims being made uh, for its policy relevance are a bit overstated. But, but the purpose, again, of showing you this slide is this excerpt is taken from a paragraph very early <coughs> in the document. And again, it uh, <coughs> refers to infant brain development. Uh, and again, the size or volume of the brain. It's interesting that after this, and the, the numbers here are the citations, several of, of them are to the, uh, to the Harvard document and the work of Jack Shankoff. The rest of the document contains no references or discussion of brain science. It occurs only in the opening paragraph or two. 
in the United States, we're having a huge debate on the wisdom of investing in universal pre-K education. This is the first paragraph of the report written by the Society for Research on Child Development, which again, if you look through uh, uh, their claims, it, it cites uh, the Harvard Center's work uh, and the importance of brain science and early brain development for lifelong prospects. This is the only mention of brain science in that document. The remainder is overwhelmingly a discussion of behavioral research. What these documents illustrate in my mind is that these claims about the effect of early experience on brain development have become so well deceived, not only among the general public, but even in uh, academic groups uh, like SRCD, that it can provide a biological background for an extended discussion of behavioral science and the policy implications of behavioral science. However, the policy debate, in my mind, on any of these issues is going to be about the validity and generalization of the behavioral findings. That's going to be notoriously difficult. Um, Experimental design and behavioral science can be a slippery thing. Sample size can be a slippery thing. Uh, and usually what these debates boil down to is claims about other people's flawed methodology. And that's going to be very difficult to present <clears throat> in an interesting way uh, to the general public uh, to come up with any compelling message at all. However, until we've characterized these behaviors, until we know what the behavioral science says, appealing to neuroscientific explanations is kind of futile. Uh, we can apply neuroscience to learning patterns and development after we know what those patterns, what those behavioral phenotypes are. Neuroscientists cannot yield reductive explanations, or should not yield reductive explanations, of non-phenomena. So, uh, used in this way, Neuroscience serves <coughs> as a background that has rhetorical value only. So, uh, I'll end with this. Uh, are we persisting in extrapolating findings about experience, expecting plasticity to areas where these results are inapplicable, as Butter suggests? Once we leave the realm of experience, expecting plasticity, what's normal? What we fail to be explicit about in many of these discussions is the kind of behaviors we want children to manifest are closely tied to ideas of social class and the prevailing ethos of uh, the population. It would be great if everybody could have a Japanese mother and live in a middle class home, but that's not going to happen. <laughs> are we translating sound science to it's framing an appropriate mechanism by which to execute this translation. Now we've seen messages framed by the advocates, but now what we're seeing is framing being done by academics to support uh, a view of policy. So we can ask what's the appropriate role of scientists, scholars, and academic institutions in this translation process. Are there situations where the roles of scholars, scientists, and advocates conflict? And I'd like to finally say the criticism of the myth about overlooking the effects of abuse, neglect, <clears throat> whatever, is a, a valid claim. But I think it's very important to bring together knowledgeable people in developmental psychology with knowledgeable people in pediatric psychiatry to see what can be done to come up with a coherent research program that would address these issues more broadly. One of the problems I have with the neuroscience-based uh, perspective is it's so focused on when things occur, it never mentions what things should happen. There are numerous instances we can point to uh, in developmental psychology where children from low socioeconomic status homes do very badly in school. They do badly in school because there are very specific things they don't know. 
when they are taught these very specific things they don't know, they perform uh, comparably to children uh, in you know, the very best middle class and upper middle class schools. So we shouldn't think of children's difficulties in learning and living as necessarily caused by malformed brains. Nothing wrong with these kids' brains. They, did, they didn't know how to compare two numbers for size, so they never could really figure out what arithmetic was supposed to be. <coughs> they never learned or it never uh, uh, was pointed out to them that to read a language like English, you have to be able to map symbols that stand for sounds onto the speech screen. They don't have this phonological awareness. When they're taught that, they can read very well. Now, there's still a substantial group of children with learning disabilities, dyslexics, dyscalculics. Uh, I doubt their learning problems are a result of the environment they grew up in. I would think that's a more deeper developmental problem where genetic explanations might shed some, some light on the issue. This is just a quote taken from a, a, the Santiago Declaration that Kathy Hirsch Pasek and I wrote following a, a, a meeting in Chile. The meeting in Chile uh, was a group of educators who came to uh, this conference to hear neuroscientists talk about uh, the importance of brain science to education. The brain scientists said, well, you know, there's really not a great deal we can tell you about how to teach reading. Uh, the behavioral science might uh, uh, be a much better help than counting synapses. But uh, uh, one thing that did concern us is that we have to recognize the limits of our own scientific disciplines, no matter what they are. Uh, and as Kathy wrote, our research can provide guides in designing the most efficient means to policy ends that cannot dictate those ends, which must arise out of political debate and social consensus. Our research can also be abused in attempts to rationalize preconceived policies and popular notions about early childhood, putting science to a rhetorical and selective rather than a rational use. And I guess it's this issue that most concerns and interests me. So we're kind of back at the beginning. Uh, we have this, this lovely scene, but uh, based on what we see about neuroscience and the literature, we can probably add a caption. <laughs> Thank you for your attention and your guidance.